Good afternoon, DEF CON. We're here to talk about getting effed on the river. And if anybody has played poker, I'm sure it's happened to you. Just to frame what we'll go over in today's session, um, first in the pre-flop section, we'll give a little background about who we are and uh, what online poker is. On the flop, we'll get into some past vulnerabilities that have been discovered in the online poker uh, software and architecture. Turn, we'll get into uh, some of the research that we have been doing and what we've been looking at, some uh, vulnerabilities that uh, I don't think have been uh, published before. And then the river, we'll get into uh, defenses and next steps in research. Um, what this talk won't do is it's not going to show you how to make millions of dollars by you know, some zero day exploit. Um, because if we had that, I'd be keeping it to myself. <laughs> So preflop, who are we? This is my company. Um, they paid to, for me to come out here, so I put a slide in there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> to make them happy, I guess. Um, who am I? Uh, Gus Fritchie, just a uh, you know security uh, professional at, based out of DC, uh, CTO of this uh, this firm, and uh, you know you can see what I like enjoy doing. Uh, I probably like to enjoy gamble gambling more than anything. So that's really what got me interested in this uh, subject. Who do I have with me? We got Steve Whitmer right here, uh, who I also work with, and uh, he did a lot of uh, research in the web app piece, which you'll see later on in the presentation. Uh, I had a little bit of help also from a couple guys who just couldn't make it. Uh, Mike Wright, who I also work with, he did a little bit of uh, work on a couple slides, and then JD Durek, he did some work in the, um, the analysis of the poker client itself and looking from a forensic perspective at what the, the client does behind the scenes. So that's who, uh, who we are. So what is online poker? How many people like to uh, gamble? Show of hands. All right, we're in the right place. How many people like to play poker? All right. How many people have played online poker? Okay, a decent perspective. How many people saw money locked up on some sites out there? All right, we're less. All right. <laughs> Me too. Well, you probably do. All right. So it seems like a lot of people have uh, at least heard of what online poker is. Um, uh, it, it, it's really interesting and uh, um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought, sorry, one second. <laughs> Some people have a misperception that it's playing against you know, the computer or not real people but you're actually playing for the most part against real people except for those pesky poker bots which we'll talk about uh, and, and later on in the, in the presentation. Um, it's been around for a while. Uh, we hear we have a you know, short time frame just to sort of show you uh, the uh, what's been going on. So we have uh, in the first in the early 90s there really was just people actually played it via IRC, um, and the poker industry as we see it today really came uh, came out in the late uh, late 1990s when Planet Poker was launched in, in 1998. Um, and then shortly after that you started having gaming commissions uh, that were launched to sort of try to regulate this industry and you can see going down the step UB, party poker. But I think when, at least when I got interested in poker and probably a lot of people um, who, who play it today got interested in 2003 uh, when Chris Moneymaker won the World Series of Poker. He satellited in on a $40 online you know, poker tournament and won $3.5 million and made everybody think that they can do the same thing. Um, so that really, uh, you know, made the industry grow. In fact, prior to that, most of the casinos here in Vegas, a lot of them didn't even, you know, were closing their poker rooms. And uh, now, I mean, most of the major casinos at least have some form of poker room. Um, and, you know, shortly after that, you had full tilt poker. I mean, everyone's, you know, if you like poker, you heard of Phil Ivey and all these, you know, famous Chris Ferguson, all these famous poker pros formed that company. Uh, 2005, you know, it became a $2 billion industry. Uh, 2006, uh, we see the U UIGEA, which is an Unlawful Internet Gaming Enforcement Act, which was tacked on to the, to the end of uh, the Port Security Act that passed in the last minute of Congress. So it was sort of, you know, uh, the Republicans trying to uh, tack something on a rider onto a bill. And that made it, didn't make it illegal to play poker, like some people may think, but it made it uh, illegal for banks to transfer money into, uh, into the poker sites. Um, so it made it a little bit more difficult and at that time we started seeing, a tr you know, the market had sort of peaked and it started going back down. 
Uh, 2007, we had a pretty, uh, pretty large cheating scandal on one of the major sites, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, into the presentation. Um, 2010, we reached six billion dollars, so you know we're, we're not going to uh, solve our debt crisis here, but it's it's still a fairly large amount of money. And then 2011, recently on 415 Black Friday, when uh, the Department of Justice seized three of the three of the major sites. And why is this important? Because I just wanted to show what the you know what's been going on from a time frame. Because I think in the beginning, you know, it wasn't big enough for people to really notice. It started getting bigger. People started noticing more. The government. And then also, I think from a security perspective, you know, whenever something gets that big, it, it obviously draws attention to it and uh, it makes you, you know, just more curious about really what security controls are in place. So I mentioned online poker current events. Uh, you know, if you go to fulltiltpoker.com or, poke, or poker stars, you'll see this, uh, this banner display. The Department of Justice has, you know, went ahead and, and, and seized the domain names for these sites. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, officially made it illegal for, not, well, maybe not illegal, but it made it much more difficult for U.S. citizens to play, um, uh, to play online poker. And uh, poker stars paid out all their players right away. So if you had money on poker stars, you got paid. But if you had money on other sites like I do, you still haven't got paid. And because of this, you know, uh, the seizure, really development of new features and functionality sort of is in a holding pattern in poker clients. Um, and another thing why it's important to mention is it sort of made our research a little bit more difficult because we were researching some of these sites and then on 4.15 they, it was more difficult to do research uh, into those sites. This slide is just here to show you why it's, uh, uh, how much money is at stake um, and why this will become important, I think we'll see in, in, in the next slide um, when you start talking about regulation and compliance. Uh, you know, Back in 2004, we're only talking about $1 billion. You know, the U.S. government doesn't really care too much. But when it starts growing, well, when I say U.S. government, maybe I mean the, 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 the Nevada casinos, uh, Harrah's, Caesars Entertainment right here, uh, start wanting to get a piece of that pie, which they currently don't have. And if you see online gambling revenue as a whole is $25 billion. So uh, in other words, you know, there's a lot of money in online poker. Uh, I put this slide on here just because I'd like to see piles of money. That's cool. Uh, regulation and compliance. <clears throat> we all have regulation and compliance in other industries. You know, if it's a government with, uh, with FISMA, PCI, SOX, whatever. And I'm not here to say that compliance and regulation is, is the best thing. We all know that just because you have a system that is certified and accredited according to FISMA or NIST standards doesn't mean it's necessarily secure. It just means you filled out you know, all the right paperwork and then dotted your I's and crossed your T's. But it's, it's better than nothing. And I think, you know, uh, there's another talk going on right now talking about PCI. And I think the argument can definitely be made that compliance helps strengthen uh, the security posture of those industries. And I think something similar needs to take place in the online poker industry. And from what I just said, you may think that there is no compliance or regulation. There is. It's just not very greatly enforced. Um, you have uh, Isle of Man, uh, you know, off the of, off of coast of England, the Kanawaki Gaming Commission, an Indian tribe licensed some of these, uh, some of these sites, but they really haven't, uh, you know, put into all the controls in place that we would expect uh, these companies to be held accountable for. Um, you know, Party Poker, a site that pulled out of the U.S. Uh, industry back in 2005 when the UIEGA came out. You know, they're licensed by government in Gibraltar. And you can read here what they say, you know, that they keep their uh, system to reliable, the highest standards of software integrity, including access control, change control, fingerprinting of executables. Um, from what we've seen, I don't think all the, the sites are really doing that. And, uh, you know, we didn't really look closely at party poker since we can't play there. I wanted to concentrate our research on sites that uh, were available to U.S. Uh, U.S. players at the time. Um, so we obviously see there is a need for uh, uh, compliance, and I think you'll see why there's a need when we get into some of the past vulnerabilities and new issues that we've noted. Um, you know, a standard needs to be developed. Companies that provide these services need to be audited, uh, just not from the financial aspect to make sure that something that happened on Black Friday doesn't happen again, but also from a computer security control perspective that 
controls need to be put in place to enforce these uh, these programs to have you know basic levels of security, which I think we take for granted uh, when we look at other systems like account lockout. Uh, uh, you know, just simple things that they just don't do. Um, and why will this happen? Because there's a lot of money in online poker, and uh, the government wants it, and land-based casinos want it. I'm not sure if anyone can make this out, but that's a, a, a one point. Uh, 1.3 million dollar pot being uh, being shipped right there, uh, which was the largest pot in online history. Just a lot of money. So the flop. <laughs> uh, sorry, just it's got distracted. Um, past vulnerabilities. So here I just want to touch on some of the vulnerabilities that you know have come, you know, from the, the beginning of when online poker first. Uh, first came into existence and uh, uh, to, to recent uh, vulnerabilities. These aren't issues that we came across ourselves. These are documented issues. I just put them in here so uh, you may not be aware of what has happened in the past. And these are all related to you know, information security, computer security. So the random number generator vulnerability. Um, I think everybody probably can guess what the random number generator is for. So, you know, obviously when you have a, a real dealer shuffling the cards, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be random, they shuffle them. So in order to get, get that same level uh, in gaming, you have a, an RNG. Um, so Planet Poker, which remember was the first online poker site to come into existence in 1998, uh, they were very proud of their online, uh, of their random number generator, so much that they published the algorithm to show that, hey, we have a good shuffling algorithm. Um, Unfortunately, when some researchers started looking at it, uh, they realized it probably wasn't the best algorithm that was in place. You can see in a real deck of cards uh, what the possible number of, uh, uh, of unique shuffles is, a, a very, very large number. Um, in their algorithm, only four billion possible shuffles uh, could result. And then to make that even a lower number, the C they were using was from the Pascal function, randomized, so that reduced the number even further. And then they were able to reduce the number of possible combinations down to a number that could be effectively uh, uh, brute force so they could tell what cards were going to be coming out. Um, you know, this has since been fixed, obviously. And other companies these days have their RNGs audited by reputable third parties. Uh, I took this from the PokerStar site. Uh, you know, Sigital, you know, uh, once went ahead and, and looked at their RNG. And all the other sites have similar information. Um, I don't know, do you, I, I'm not sure. You know, we didn't look at this to see if the, the RNG is, uh, is, you know, is safe or secure. Um, maybe it is. Maybe it's not. But it's probably something that that, that should be looked at further. The the next one I want to cover, as far as uh, a past vulnerability, if you remember, this was on the timeline, and it was on the timeline just because I, th I think it's a pretty important uh, issue. Was this uh, ultimate bet absolute poker? Uh, super user issue. And, and the full story is really almost like a, a soap opera. I mean, uh, you really should read, if you're interested in, in a good read, read this blog. Uh, that's uh, the URL is up there. She goes into a lot of details as far as, you know, what happened behind the scenes, why it possibly happened. You know, just to give you a little flavor, it involved uh, a teacher sleeping with a student and then a lawsuit. And, uh, you know, I guess I needed to make some money. Um, uh, what happened was, uh, and not all of this is 100% you know, confirmed because it's not like poker was legal in the United States or regulated, so you couldn't go ahead and uh, you know, bring these people to, to court. Um, but what we've been able to piece together is that the owner of the company went to his developer, a software developer, and said, hey, I think people are cheating on my site in the high stakes you know, games. In order for me to determine if they're cheating, I need to be able to see their whole cards so I can see, you know, make sure that they're cheating because I would know based on what their whole cards are if they were cheating. So the original developer was like, you know, I don't think that's a good idea to give someone access to see whole cards. So he went to an independent contractor and hired him and they put in this guide mode is what they called it. So uh, they ended up putting into the, to the actual software a, uh, a process and uh, you know, they wanted to put some controls in this process because, he, I mean, the developer really thought that at the time that the owner was doing this for a legitimate purpose. So they made it so you couldn't be on the same computer playing with, as with God mode running. But what we suspected they do is they simply, 
had a user, you know, in guide mode, and then just relayed that information to the uh, to the person playing. Um, and and at the end, you can see how much money uh, was was stolen: twenty-two million dollars uh, from players. So that, that that's you know not a small sum uh, of money. And and how did they end up catching or you know uh, discovering that this guide mode had been put into the software? Was it from the the strict controls that were built into the software, auditing, access control, someone reviewing logs? No, it was from the community, the online poker community. Um, uh, and there's a, there's a pretty strong uh, online poker community. There's a lot of forums. I think Steve's going to talk a little bit about how you could leverage those forums uh, for some malicious purposes. But uh, what, what they were able to do was, you know, the players started suspecting, wow, this one guy is, is winning a lot of hands. And online poker is different than regular poker. You know, a lot of people play eight to ten tables at once. So in real poker, you know, like you see on TV, people get reads by looking at people and they know betting patterns and they can sort of tell when people are bluffing. But with online poker, uh, you don't have that. So uh, based on your hand histories, you know, what people are being dealt, uh, you're able to, you know, see those hand histories and people have written software that gives you uh, a statistical analysis over, you know, how many, who's won what hands, who, you know, how many times they saw the flop, how many times they three bet you, et cetera. Um, so based on this information, they were able to show this, you know, they, they created this graph that showed here's, you know, in the blue is, you know, a, a statistical analysis over win rates uh, over a certain number of hands at a certain level. And then you can see this outlier in yellow who's winning at an obscene rate. So this made them suspect that there's no way in the world this guy could be winning at, 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 such, a, uh, at such a large rate. Um, so eventually, you know, they went to, you know, there's enough pressure from the community that they went to the, the company, and the company finally did their own investigation and admitted, yeah, hey, someone was cheating, you know, and uh, they tried to refund the money. You know, a lot of players did get money back who were playing high stakes, uh, but it's still suspected that they didn't get paid back in full. Um, you know, so lessons learned from this. Uh, I think it's lessons that, you know, other industries have already learned. Configure... Was it what? It, 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 it's suspected that it was the owner. Uh, uh, I mean, it's suspected uh, Russ Hamilton, who was the owner of uh, Ultimate Poker and Ab Ultimate Bet and Absolute Poker, it was suspected that he was involved. Um, you know, once again, there's no proof, so it's just alleged. Uh, but, you know, he had past ethical issues and uh, it, it is largely suspected that he was the, you know, the main culprit. But other companies, industries have learned this. Configuration management, separation of duties, code reviews, uh, have a solid SDLC in place, have auditing. Uh, these are things that, you know, banking has in place, other uh, institutions that we rely on in industries, but it's not there yet in poker, which shows the need for compliance. Just to give another example, um, I mentioned that, uh, you know, hand histories are, are important to online poker. You know, if you play the hand, you, you know, you get to the hand history of, of what happened. So, you know, if you play, you know, as many hands as I had, you'll have a, a huge, you know, hand history file. Some people don't have, you know, the luxury of playing that many hands and they want to, you know, maybe gain an advantage. So there's companies that have sprouted up that do data mining and collect all the information um, and then go about, go about and sell it. Why is that important? Well, it, they sort of stumble upon this SSL exploit by accident. Um, you know, they weren't trying to, you know, there wasn't like a company that was out there doing uh, vulnerability research. You know, they were trying to get the hand histories, a software version update came about, and all of a sudden, they're, you know, they couldn't grab data mine and hand histories. So they started looking at it and, and looking, you know, after analysis, they saw that it really wasn't SSL, they were just XORing the data, which I guess they thought was secure. But, uh, you know, obviously, we know it's not, um, uh, but you know, the, the general public, you know, they thought they were playing, you know, a, a protected, you know, a protected communication channel the whole time. And, you know, these guys actually came up with a nice little proof of concept. If you Google about this, you'll, you'll see it. You see a video where they showed if you were on the same, you know, network or same wireless network, you could actually see uh, other people's whole cards. And, you know, they did go ahead and fix it 11 days later because it's hard to implement SSL. It's very difficult. Um, and then also Cake Network was also discovered to be vulnerable shortly after. So um, I'm not sure why they are doing this, but uh, 
who knows. Uh, but this is something that could have got caught, if you think about it, even if you go to something as simple as looking at FISMA, uh, you know, there's specific controls there that, you know, say, that look at data confidentiality and data integrity, and, and you would do testing to, you know, certify that the system is, you know, using encryption. Um, but there's no regulation in place. Miscellaneous account compromise. This slide's in here just to give you a, a, an idea. You know, I just Googled, you know, poker account, you know, hacked. And, you know, you can't, there, there's just hundreds of postings here of people who have been hacked either through some type of uh, social engineering, you know, uh, phishing, you know, uh, just guessing passwords, as we'll talk about uh, later on. But there's just so many different ways that poker uh, the poker software and gaming can be, uh, can, can be uh, exposed. Poker bots. Uh, this is also, I mean, it's not necessarily a vulnerability. Uh, I mean, poker bots have been around uh, for, for a long time, um, you know, since the beginning of the poker industry. Um, but when they were new, they just really weren't that good. I mean, you could easily beat poker bots, but now with artificial intelligence becoming as good as it is, uh, you, you know, there's some very good bot software out there, and it, it puts the player obviously at a disadvantage. I mean, it's different if you know you're playing against a bot and you're playing against a, a, a you know a real human. Um, you know, and the reason that it's just more difficult to create a poker bot is because the lack of information. Like, you know, there's definitely really good you know chess software or chess bots. That's because you know everything in chess. It's, you know, all the information is in front of you. In poker, it's a game of limited information. You have some information, but the rest, you know, you just have to guess. Uh, there's a very, if you're really interested in the technical details of it, you know, you can look at this, uh, this article on coding the wheel. Uh, unfortunately, there's not, if this is really the best that thing that I found that was out there. There's not a lot of good information about the bots that's easily accessible because the people who are writing them are making money with them and they don't want to share, uh, share that information. Um, so you sort of have to know where to go to, to, to look for it. Um, and even then it's difficult as far as the, the technical details. Um, just a little bit of information. Once again, that, that article goes into a lot of detail. But really the way that the poker bots work and we just thought it was interesting, you know, it, it's primarily through DLL injection. Um, it's not modifying, uh, you know, the actual executable or binary because uh, as you'll see when we look at the, the, the next section about the poker client under the, underneath the hood, you know, it does a lot of checks and balances to see if you've made some potential modifications. So it's primarily through DLL injection um, that, you know, it's able to, uh, uh, to, to operate. Uh, and of course, poker sites have been cracking down on bots. Uh, how do they catch them? Uh, betting patterns, you know, if it's always, always bet the same amount, tendencies, you know, bots definitely play differently, programming flaws, if you're always clicking the bet on the same pixel, you know, it's going to know that it is actually a, a bot. And then of course, scanning, as you will see, these poker clients, you know, they do try to protect you uh, by examining your system, but uh, in that process, they also invade your privacy a little bit, but I mean, that's one way that the sites uh, attempt to catch you. Um, and of course, when a player is identified as a bot, you know, they'll go ahead and, uh, you know, confiscate all your winnings and close your account down. How do we know that? Well, we, we got caught, so uh, they're, they're doing something right, I guess. Um, uh, poker client equals rootkit. No, no, we, we, the question was, did we write our own bot? We didn't write our own bot. We were, this was just experiment with one of the known bots out there that we were playing around with. Yeah. Um, so poker client equals rootkit, and, and maybe I, that's not 100% accurate, but it, it's close. It has a lot of the same characteristics as a rootkit, and uh, you know, in the attempt to protect, I guess, the, the gaming, it, it really goes down and, and does some things that you may not know about, um, you know, including you know going into you know where you've been in your web cache. I don't like people knowing where I've been. Uh, what does it do behind the scenes? We did uh, some dynamic analysis. We didn't do any static analysis of, uh, of what it's doing yet. But here's some interesting things that we just pulled out, or at least what, you know, what, what JD and I thought were, uh, were interesting. Some of the function calls looking for you know, enemy window names, enemy processes, enemy URLs, and then uh, some of the, the programs that 
or services that it deems unauthorized. So here you can look at like if you're looking for Ali debug um, if it's running. You know, it's looking, you know, if you're running some of this software that it considers to be uh, against its terms of service. Um, once again, this is just very basic analysis. I'm sure it's doing a lot more uh, behind the scenes and it's just an avenue that we're going to explore uh, further. Here's just some well-known modifications or behavior that we've observed uh, in the poker clients. Uh, it goes ahead and will modify your, uh, your host-based uh, firewall policies if you're running it on Windows. It goes scanning through your Windows process tables. Uh, it has the ability to go ahead and read the, you know, the body and bar text of every window uh, that you have open. It has the ability to detect mouse movements. These are all things that the poker client is doing behind the scenes. Um, you know, we mentioned that it scans for uh, known bot software. You know, it also looks for, uh, you know, the lack of, you can, of course, when you're playing poker, part of the fun is, you know, talking to people, you know, uh, and you can do that on online poker too by chatting in a dialog box. So, you know, it sort of monitors what you chat in a dialog box. Um, and here you can see the screenshot of it, you know, it's going through uh, your, uh, your, your Internet Explorer cache there. So it's, it's going through looking for, well, who knows what? I'm not, and we're not really sure what it does with this information. I'm not sure if it sends it back, um, uh, you know, to the mothership. Uh, but you know, it, it definitely looks like it's somewhat invasive uh, to, to your privacy. And of course, you're agreeing to allow it to do this since you click on the terms of service when you install the software. But most people probably don't know uh, exactly what it's doing behind the scenes. Um, and these these clients are you know somewhat complex. You know we looked at the Cake Poker client. You know has three main processes. Uh, the client scans itself, like I mentioned, at random intervals to make sure you didn't modify it. Because we did go ahead and we made some modifications uh, to the actual client, and uh, it, end up, it ended up you know detecting that and, and forcing you to install a new version. Um, and then the Cake Poker's actual executable, as you can see, when you compare uh, Cake Poker to the Bodog version, the size. Uh, the, the actual poker client is, is obfuscated and uh, encrypted and making it more difficult for someone uh, to do static analysis. Uh, Did you see what obfuscator they were using? The question was, do you see what obfuscated uh, they were using or encryption? We, we really didn't look too closely uh, at that yet. Um, that's something that we, we plan on looking at uh, in the near future. And now I'll turn it over to, uh, to Steve. All right, thanks, Gus. Um, so I got involved in this process kind of late in the game. A lot of this research was kind of already ongoing, so I got pulled in to kind of look at some of the, the actual interactions with the client and the, uh, the web clients themselves. So just to get into a little bit about the uh, actual online poker network architecture, um, especially now that there's a lot of uh, crackdown on uh, poker in the U.S., uh, you're going to be visiting a server somewhere internationally. Um, and, you know, various, various countries have various rules about data security and things like that. So just something to keep in mind as you're going to these uh, poker sites. Uh, basically what happens when you uh, log in, you make a request out to the Internet, poker DNS server tells you which uh, local server you're going to go to, you authenticate, you get a session created, and then uh, you start playing poker, and then when you need to re-authenticate, you re-authenticate. Uh, this is just kind of a, a really simple dump on um, some of the actual data flying past. Um, it's really not that important, but it shows that uh, the initial request is out over uh, SSL, and then you get another connection over SSL on another high-numbered port. Um, this is just a really, really quick uh, scan of some of uh, Bodog's address space. Just shows that there's a lot of different stuff out there. There's actually some content that doesn't belong to Bodog. There's some stuff that's on Bodog's network that's actually game creation companies and things like that. Um, there's also some test servers out there. Uh, we didn't really attack it, um, but just interesting that it's out there. Um, now, now to preface what we're going to talk about today. We did not, at least I didn't, <laughs> um, I didn't actually attack any of these companies. The vulnerabilities that we're going to be talking about are vulnerabilities that are going to affect you as a poker player. Um, so I think that's kind of more important because from the show of hands earlier, a lot of people in here play online poker. If you're in this talk, you probably are getting the idea that it's not the most secure thing in the world at this particular point. So we're just going to talk about some of the, uh, some of the vulnerabilities that are there. 
Uh, like I said, I came into this very late in the game just a few weeks ago, uh, but the vulnerabilities were really easy to find. Um, something else to consider when we're talking about vulnerabilities in online poker. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of online poker sites, all with individual clients. So when we say that this is kind of a, a new research field that we're looking into, we really haven't kind of scratched the surface at this point. But just the stuff that we did find shows that you can be compromised fairly easily. Um, let's see here. Uh, so you know, when you go to these particular sites, they have 20 different links on how you can pay them money. Uh, but they don't really have any kind of information about how they protect your information, how they protect your credit card data, how they're actually protecting you when you're playing online poker. Um, now, for all of you out there who uh, look for the HackerSafe logo, uh, I'm sure that gives you a really warm, fuzzy feeling at night, uh, but you should really know better. And these guys don't even bother to do that. So it seems like, uh, you know, when there was the actual detection of the RNG issues, a lot of the poker companies kind of stepped it up and really started looking at their RNGs, but they haven't done anything really on the clients to protect you. Um, I wish we were going to stand here and talk about some really, really advanced hacking techniques, but hackers are lazy. We like the easiest way we can get into something, and honestly, there's some old tried and true favorites that can, uh, that can really screw you. So when we talk about uh, some of the vulnerabilities out there, uh, there's basically no input validation uh, in a lot of these clients. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. The cookies that are being used when you're actually using um, an HTTP um, client as opposed to a thick client, the cookies are very insecure. Um, they're weak. They're not marked as secure. They're not marked HTTP only. Uh, they can be reused. They contain sensitive information. Some of them are tracking you based on your IP address, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, there's expired SSL certificates on some of these sites. Uh, the fun thing about that is if you get used to seeing, OK, yeah, the site's you know, expired, blah, 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 SSL doesn't match, you can kind of get accustomed to that. And if you do get fished, it's really easy for you to just click through that without even reading it or thinking about it. Um, and then we have our old friend, cross-site scripting. Now, this particular one, this is an unauthenticated, reflected cross-site scripting. Uh, reflected cross-site scripting is basically the easiest style of attack where you send something to the, uh, to the web server, um, it sends the same code back to you and is then executed at the browser. Uh, the next one that we've got, uh, this is just showing you a little bit of uh, the actual, uh, in the Bodog client, um, where you can enter some information about yourself. So you can put your email address, uh, your address, your state, your city, all that kind of good stuff. And, you know, personally, I live at Script Alert Way. Um, so it's important for me to be able to do this, but for most people, it's not. The funny thing about this, um, the actual city is vulnerable, state, zip code, country, and phone number. Now, for phone number, you shouldn't need to put characters in there. Okay, so what we're doing right here is we're really talking about they're not even doing basic data validation at this point. When you're looking at a state, it's even abbreviated. You've got MA, you've got MD, you've got wherever you live, there's a two letter. You should not be able to put JavaScript into that, okay? <laughs> this is easy, guys. Um, zip code, again, it's, it's not that hard. These are supposed to be only numbers. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that's vulnerable as of today, as of this morning. <laughs> Not that I'm telling you to go out and use this, um, but this particular one, uh, this is actually using um, a stored and DOM-based cross-site scripting attack. Uh, as you saw on the previous slide, what we did is we put uh, you know, some active JavaScript in, in our address field. This comes back and this shows you every single cookie you need. So if you're using the web client, you can create your cross-site scripting attack to then forward this information to your server. You grab that, you replay that, you're now that person. So you have a copy of their session. Not good. This one's an unauthenticated one. Uh, again, you can grab, uh, you know, you can call document.cookie to grab all of the cookies have them forwarded to your server, and you created a duplicate session. You can log in as this person, and you can sign up to a table that you're also playing at, and just fold, 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 and just lose somebody's money. So not so good. 
Uh, again, as we talked about quite a bit here, <clears throat> it, it's basically a playground for cross-site scripting. For those of you who are actually pen testers out there who are used to having to do some encoding to get cross-site scripting to work, you don't need to do it. You can basically go there and just be like, eh, I wonder if this works. And you can kind of play around and have some fun with it. Um, and it's actually kind of cool because it's like stepping back three or four years in time and you can just make all kinds of fun stuff happen. Um, there's also some invalidated redirects. And the thing that I love about this one, and, and we're kind of picking on Bodog, and I want to clarify a lot of the poker clients have these vulnerabilities. It's not just Bodog. But they're an easy target, so why not? We talked about them. Um, the actual SSO that's used when you sign in to Bodog is vulnerable. So as you'll see on uh, these couple of URLs down at the bottom, <clears throat> you can actually send somebody wherever you want. Um, and we'll talk about where you can actually leverage this in a minute. So using some of these vulnerabilities. Uh, we've beaten to death cross-site scripting now. Everybody knows what cross-site scripting is. It's not so good. Uh, you've got cross-site request forgery as well. Um, some of these clients, uh, this doesn't really matter, but crossdomain.xml, when you're using a flash-based poker client, um, cr you want cross-domain to be locked down to at least things on the top-level domain. So uh, cake poker, for example. If you want cake poker, uh, you should only allow cake poker, star.cakepoker, whatever you want to do. You should not have a star in there. And many, 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 many of these sites just have star in their cross-domain policy. Now, that, what, what that means is you can basically decompile a Flash client, do whatever the heck you want to it, recompile it, and then start playing actively in some of these games because they're allowing content from anywhere. Um, and you know, this is, again, there's lots and lots more you can do with this. This is all just the really, really easy stuff to do. And we didn't want to stand up here and be like, all right, here's how you take down poker right now. But I will say, there is more. Um, one of the things that's uh, a good attack vector, especially when you talk about cross-site request forgery and cross-site scripting as far as actually getting people uh, suckered into this, um, is actually using forums and affiliate sites. Now, the fun thing about using forums is generally when somebody's at a forum, they're logged into the poker client. And they're just kind of chatting and doing whatever they want. But, you know, if they're logged in, You've got great targets for cross-site scripting because you know they have active cookies. They have active sessions. You can grab this information, take it, replay it, done. Also with cross-site request forgery, if you've got something um, that you can do like a get to post translation, or, or post to get translation, excuse me, um, you can then just kind of say, all right, as soon as you load this particular page, you're folding. Whatever, whatever you happen to be in. Um, so the fun thing with this is you can oftentimes, uh, in forums, uh, because we all know forums are really secure, right? Yeah, good times. Um, you can actually just create hyperlinks uh, where you should have an avatar, for example. So whenever anybody loads that page and it goes to load your avatar, it just executes that particular URL. So fold your hand, et cetera. Um, so anyway, these are just really, really good attack platforms and forums and stuff like that have their own vulnerabilities. So even if you're using a secure poker client, if you're on somebody else's forum and they have cross-site scripting, they can hook you. So here we have, you know, picking on Bodog again just because it's easy. Uh, one of their affiliates not checking cross-site scripting, not even trying. Uh, here's poker listings. Uh, poker listings is another place uh, that has cross-site scripting. This was a really, really hard one, guys, I got to tell you. Uh, so you see that search field right there? Script alert. That's all this is. They're not even checking. It's easy, easy, easy stuff. So what do we do when we have cross-site scripting? How many people know what beef is? All right, good. So you know where I'm going with this, right? You've got beef, you know, and here you can see three clients that are all, you know, a local address that I was just playing around with. There's so many from my local one because everything I tried worked. It was really, really easy to do this, guys. So step one on this, um, this, is what, uh, this is what an actual hook looks like in Beef. So you've got your target domain, you've got then the payload there that says, you know, connect back to me, blah, 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 blah. 
Once you've got a zombie inside of Beef, you can look at their browser. Um, you can see what plugins they're using. Uh, you can see uh, where they've been in their browser history. Um, I'm not going to go down the full functionality of Beef, but Beef is a really cool tool, and if you haven't used it, use it. It's good. Um, you can do clipboard theft. You can send raw JavaScript. You can use browser autopwn. Yay, Metasploit. Um, and you can also, um, you know, use that once you have, um, you know, browser autopwn running. Anybody who you've hooked in with XSS is now a pivot point. So let's say somebody's playing poker at work. You know, nobody would ever, on a government machine, for example, play poker at work. Nobody would ever do that, right? Uh, so now you've got a pivot point inside of a government network because web traffic goes through firewalls. Yay. So the fun part is, after this, of course, you have profit. So the, one of the things that we wanted to do uh, is kind of hint at this, but not really tell you exactly how to do it. But if you've got a Metasploit zombie, or if you've got a beef zombie, if you can send them JavaScript, and you can capture their clipboard. Hands up how many people think you can see their hold cards? More hands. Yeah. So there you go. Still feeling good about online poker? Everybody who's signed up? Yeah? No? Okay. Well, I'm going to turn it back over to Gus. He's going to do some more talking. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, Moving away from uh, web application attacks uh, that Steve went over to some authentication vulnerabilities, and you know, like Steve mentioned, you know, while sophisticated attacks are fun to go ahead uh, and, and do, uh, in this instance, you really don't have to do anything elite uh, in order to uh, compromise some of these uh, some of these sites. As you can see here, uh, here's just some of the, the password requirements. I just went ahead and, and sampled some of the of a larger site so you can see exactly what they're requiring. So you can see carbon poker requires 6 to 20 characters. Well, I wonder what people are going to choose if they choose carbon. Perhaps carbon as their password. Or Bodog, five characters. Maybe they have Bodog or maybe it's poker. You know, full tilt, UB absolute, also weak. I'm in fact the only one that had uh, strong uh, password requires, requirements was cake poker with, you know, what you would expect, something 8 to 14, lowercase, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, so with passwords this strong, it, it's probably you know impossible to bre brute force them, right? Especially with no account lockout, none of these sites will lock out your account. You can try it as many times as you want. Um, and uh, of course, you need to have the actual you know user ID to log in with, right? So how do we find that? Forums. Well, forums, you know. Whoever you're playing against, most of the times, whatever their name on screen is, is going to be their user ID. And then, of course, there's also uh, Poker Table Ratings, which is another site that tracks uh, players, you know, how much they've won or lost. So you can go to Poker Table Ratings, and perhaps you want to do a search for those people who have won a lot of money, and we can target their uh, their accounts. And you know, of course, the next step is, you know, nothing rocket science. You know, just like the cross-site scripting. You know, we don't have to do anything fancy here. We just go ahead and use Hydra or Brutus. In this case, we just went ahead and, and, and used Brutus. Um, uh, this is actually on Bodog, which was, was somewhat different than some of the other sites. You could log in with a username, or you could also log in with this unique number. You see here it's 3830000. Um, so this is what they're, you could log in with these type of numbers. What's, what's also interesting about this is that when you create a new account, it just increments it by one. I'm not sure if that's too important, or but it's, it's interesting that it just increments it by one. So you, of course, just using Brutus, you can go ahead and uh, just script this, and you can see on our our test account um, that we uh, that that we used it. You know, it brute forced it, and you know, very quickly, of course. And trust me, poker players, they're, they're not the the most sophisticated players uh, when it comes to you know putting strong protections in place. Most of the time they're pretty lazy and uh, I guarantee a lot of them have pretty, pretty easy passwords. Um, yeah, it's like they're not risk adverse. <laughs> exactly. You know, they're used to just gambling large sums of money. Um, one, I want to make one point. Uh, most of the research that we did was on the play money sites. Uh, because the play, every one of these sites has a play money site that is equivalent to the, the software is the same as the, the real money site, but we just didn't feel like using, you know, putting, I didn't feel like using my account because I didn't want to have 
have it shut down for some reason and have my money confiscated. Um, anyways, uh, another thing, attacking supporting infrastructure. I think Steve, uh, Steve went over this, uh, gave some good examples as far as forums, but it's just not the poker client itself. And that's what I want to emphasize throughout this whole talk. It's the whole poker industry that has weak controls. And uh, you know, with the, the, the poker gaming, these other you know, people want to make money off of it. So they come up with new ideas. So there's training sites to teach you how to be a better poker player. There's tracking sites like Poker Table Ratings and Sharkscope that will track your play and show you how much you've won or lost. There's medium forums like Steve mentioned. Uh, two plus two is you know, the, probably the largest one out there. Um, and of course, if these sites are being used at the same time that, that people are playing the game, well, then if there's vulnerabilities in them, as Steve showed you, you could potentially uh, compromise them. So some, just some quick examples. Another you know, cross-site scripting. This is actually in poker table ratings. You can actually make comments about players like you suck or whatever. And uh, if you put some you know, script in there, when someone else goes ahead and reads that comment, you, know, you could have obviously something much more malicious than this there. Um, attacking supporting infrastructure, continuing. Uh, this is about training sites. And uh, this is actually an email that I received because I belong to training sites because I like to try to make money when I play poker. And this is from, I think, Card Runners uh, sent me this, letting me know that they had detected an illegal intrusion and that you know, they believe that you know, all they got potentially was my email address, encrypted password, IP address. Um, uh, and you know, so it just shows that people are actually uh, attacking these guys. Um, I actually sent these guys an email and said, hey, I can maybe look at this for you. And, they said they had it under control, so. <laughs> okay. uh, just another forum. Uh, this just shows you, it, it may not be able to see it, but it's just a warning from, that's posted on the forum showing that someone has set up an archive site to look just like the 2 plus 2 and they're doing some phishing there. So just you know, warning their forum members to be careful. So obviously people are going out and targeting these uh, supporting infrastructures. So almost done. The river. So just what are some online poker defenses that could be put in place? Um, and this is more on the, the application uh, side. We'll talk next about what you could do yourself to protect. Um, maybe move away from password-based authentication because we know multi-factor can't be hacked, but um, it, it's better. Uh, implement simple things, account lockout, secure, uh, perform robust security testing, um, perhaps only allow connections from you know, the geographic location where you're supposed to be located. So if you're in the U.S., uh, you probably don't want someone from China logging into your account. Uh, of course, you get it around that, but it makes it more difficult I and mean, maybe adhere to some certain standards. Uh, online poker defenses. What can you do to, uh, to help protect yourself? Um, I, I personally play poker in an isolated you know, virtual machine that's just used just for poker. So I don't do anything else uh, with that. I have a particular VM just for poker. I don't check email. I don't get on the web with it. All I do is play poker on it. Um, you know, obviously basic, oh, basic security stuff. Use antivirus spyware. Don't play on wireless networks. Uh, strong complex passwords. Um, don't use the same password across multiple sites. You know, common sense stuff. Next steps. Uh, we're going to continue digging deeper into the client, some static analysis. You know, maybe look to try to customize a client to bypass restrictions. Uh, perhaps write an automated tool just to better brute force, you know, the actual client itself rather than the web piece. Uh, I think it would be fun to map out more of these networks and see exactly, you know, from an infrastructure pr perspective, you know, all these test servers and other things that are out there. And then, of course, you know, keep on digging at the web application vulnerabilities. So conclusion, why I don't think we talked about anything earth shattering here as far as, you know, stuff that we all know about. I just don't think a lot of people have been thinking about it from an online poker perspective. So, you know, we're going to continue looking at it. If you're interested in online poker, there's a lot of smarter people than me out in that room. Uh, so, so please, you know, you look at it and let me know if you find anything. Um, you know, regulation and compliance, you know, needs to be put into place. And, you know, the, the question is, do I feel safe playing? You know, if, if poker was, you know, online poker was legal, you know, tomorrow, would I play? Well, I'd probably play, but that's because I have a gambling problem. But uh, uh, I, I don't know about the rest of you. So uh, that's it. Questions? You know, we'll, we'll be in, I guess, Q2 to, to answer anything. Thank you, guys.